Well, hello everybody. Thank you so much for um, attending this presentation today. Um, we're going to be running you through the new AD3, which is a plug-on transmitter for the Axiom Digital Platform. Um, the point of this is to allow you to change any wired microphone or any device with an XLR connector into a digital wireless transmitter. Um, the pricing on this uh, in the UK is £810, in Europe it's €900, Euros, and in America it is $999. So I've got some colleagues with me to help us run through this. Uh, we've got Dave from our sales team, and uh, Dave is going to take us a little bit through um, some Axiom Digital Refresh, because we're aware that this particular product format might be new to some of our broadcast friends. So Dave is going to do a refresh of Axiom Digital and what it does and where it came from and why it's important. And then we'll come to Stuart, who's going to run through the AD in a bit more detail, show us some of the features and how you would go about setting a system up. Um, we are using Axiom Digital in this presentation today. I've got an AD3 here on one of our VPH uh, long handhelds, which is, you know, to give you the full broadcast flavor. And then Dave and Stuart are both on um, AD body pack transmitters. Um, if you've got any questions, please use the Q&A function. Uh, my colleague Mark from marketing is on the call who will moderate those questions and there'll be plenty of time to ask those at the end. Um, and I think that's everything. That's all the housekeeping. Without further ado, I think we'll come across to uh, Dave. So could you just give us a, a roundup of what Axiom Digital is and, and where it came from? Yeah, OK. Um, a little bit of background about Spectrum and Spectrum changes, first of all. Um, over the last 10 years, we've seen increasing demand, particularly from the mobile phone sector, for Spectrum to host their data services in. Uh, and PMSC, which is Program Making and Special Events, we share um, this, this, the, the UHF TV band with the TV stations. We operate in between the TV stations, and those spaces are, are licensable. But over the last 10 years, we've seen in 2013 the loss of the 800 meg band, which is where analog TV lived. And that was switched off, and that was handed over to the mobile phone companies for their 4G services. And then this year, in May, uh, we lost access to the, uh, the 700 meg band, uh, which will be the new home for 5G mobile services. And then over in America, they're doing their own thing and they've lost access to the 600 meg band. So the space that's left um, is much, much less than a third of what, than what we originally started off with. Additionally, all of the TV channels that used to live in those bits of spectrum that we no longer have have been repacked into the spectrum that's left, so the space that's left isn't, you know, isn't all available for, for uh, program ma making special events or for wireless microphones. Uh, and at the same time, we've seen productions over the last 10 years become increasingly sophisticated mm -hmm. and complex. Um, and so, I, I mean, a good example of that, the current format of, um, of, of reality talent shows, um, I think the first sort of example of, of this new clutch of those shows was Pop Idol and they had something like 27 channels of RF on that show and today um, Britain's Got Talent, X Factor, The Voice, those kind of shows have well in excess of 100, 100 channels of RF so you can see how um, the challenge year on year to be able to fit the, the required number of channels into less space uh, is increasingly difficult. Um, Another problem is increased uh, potential for interference. So we've got lots of new products on shows now like LED wall, which uh, took out a lot, lot of RF noise. So that presents a challenge from an RF perspective. Uh, and we've literally got to a point now where analog products just don't cut it anymore. Mm -hmm. We can't run enough channels uh, of those analog systems uh, to be able to meet the demands of the productions. Um, so we've had to make the transition uh, to digital. There's been pressure on manufacturers such as ourselves to bring new products to the market that address those concerns uh, and get us back to a point where we can run those shows. Um, so Axiom Digital actually replaces two tiers of the old analog uh, portfolio. Uh, it replaces uh, UHFR uh, and also the, um, the legacy Axiom Analog product. Uh, Axiom Analog was pretty groundbreaking for mm -hmm. its time. Uh, it, it introduced some, some really, really uh, cool features uh, that, that weren't available on anything else, and it really pushed the boundaries of what Analog could do. But Axiom Analog could still only manage 12 channels in an 8 meg TV uh, channel space. Uh, and typically with the new digital systems, we can do double that. 
or close to 23 channels in standard mode and then we have a, an HD mode which will do up to 63 channels if the uh, if the RF conditions will allow that um, so as I said Axiom analog was was a was pushing the boundaries of what analog can do uh, and as with all really high level analog products it was expensive to mm -hmm. manufacture uh, and therefore it was expensive to buy and it was really only accessible to the very highest level production so Olympic open cer opening ceremonies and uh, Super Bowl finals that kind of thing um, UHFR, which sat just below Axiom Axi Analog, uh, was kind of the ma show's mainstay for a long time, a touring platform, really popular, uh, a premium product, but at an affo affordable price. Uh, and Axiom Digital replaced both of those tiers of the portfolio. And there was a little bit of a concern at the beginning that Axiom Digital would be kind of Axiom Analog money. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that um, we have a scalable system, so we've got a common receiver platform uh, which is available as a dual or a quad receiver and those receivers work with a whole range of different transmitters depending on the level of redundancy and uh, you know, functions like remote control if the, if the, if the, the project requires that. Um, so, so yeah, we've got um, a new high order digital modulation scheme. Uh, which is allowing us to send more data in less time. So we've got great RF performance, we've got low latency. Um, we've still got all of the functions from Accent Analog in there. So we've got things like interference detection. So the system will give you an alert if there's, a, if there's a, a, an interference event. Uh, and, uh, and then there's some further options uh, to, to mitigate that. Um, we've got... Um, as I said, the standard mode, which gives, gives us uh, 23 channels, HD mode, 63 channels. Um, the other thing is it's a wide tuning system, um, but the relationship between receiver and transmitters is a one-to-one -one relationship. So we've got the same tuning width on the transmitters that we have on the receivers. So you don't need two or three sets of transmitters to cover the, the receiver tuning window. Um, and as I say, it's, it's scal scalable. We've got something like We've got, well, we've got three different form factors of handhelds. We've got five different form factors of body packs. Mm -hmm. And now we've got the new AD3. So the, the upgrade grade path from UHFR was to the AD level of transmitter. And the AD3 effectively is the upgrade path for the old UR3. So um, there are some other side benefits of moving to digital. So things like encryption. Uh, which is incredibly uh, important for the broadcast world so that people aren't um, able to um, eavesdrop on uh, sensitive uh, performances or sensitive, you know, filming, uh, you know, maybe a new movie or something like that. that that's uh, that's uh, a closely guarded secret. Um, and we also now have uh, the ability to move audio through digital audio networks such as, such as Dante. Mm. Uh, so that kind of covers the receiver. Do we want okay. to talk in, in some detail about the, the actual inputs and outputs? Well, let's have a little look in detail at just some of those points. Mm. So I think we've got a slide just to, to recap where we were at. And I think this was about 2012. This is what the portfolio looked like. So um, this, you know, is acting analog, as you said, the top tier and then UHFR. And I believe that at this point, the only plug on transmitter that we offered was part of the UHFR platform. It was, yes. So um, we then moved, as you said, to an Axiom digital based platform. This is where we are today. And by losing UHFR, we, we haven't had a, a plug on in the portfolio for quite some time. No. So could you just talk us through where we are now, what this looks like if you were to come into the market today and want to get some wireless from us? Yeah, so QLXD is our mid-tier level digital wireless product. It, uh, it has the ability also to, uh, to, to do 23 channels in an 8 meg um, TV space. Um, it's available as a single, a single, um, a, a half rack single receiver only. We move up to its bigger brother, ULXD, which takes us into dual and quad receivers and adds things like um, the, the the Dante network uh, and so on and so forth. Then we come into to uh, Axiom Digital with AD transmitters, which is the upgrade path, as I said, from uh, the old analog UHF UHFR system, and then. 
the upgrade path from the old Axian analog system, but actually it's much more accessible now to, to a wider range of users because of the price point. It, it would be uh, Axian digital, the AD trans, um, receivers, but with the ADX transmitters. Okay, and let's have a little look at that transmitter ecosystem now, because th there's quite a lot that we offer in terms of transmission. So um, on the left hand side here, you can see the standard AD transmitters. So the thing that defines this is that we're just sending data in one direction from transmitter to receiver. Yeah. Um, and that is as, as it's always been in UHFR, but obviously now we're doing that with the digital modulation scheme. Yeah. And on the right hand side, we can see the more expensive ADX transmitters. Could you just quickly run through what makes those special for us? Very, very briefly. So the ADX transmitters have the, the ability to be um, controlled, you know, remote control uh, through the show link system, they're, they're show link enabled. Uh, and that means we can control all of the par parameters of the ADX transmitters by remote control, including the frequency itself. Uh, so if the system was to give us uh, an interference alert, um, we have the ability to move those transmitters to new frequencies even in the middle of a performance. Okay. That's really cool, but just to be fully clear, the AD3, which we're talking about today, the plug-on transmitter, does not have that function. It doesn't have the remote control function, yes. It's an AD level. Okay. So transmitter. with that in mind, would you just sum up for us some of the features of the Axiom Digital in one direction that will be beneficial to our, to our broadcast customers? Yeah, so I mean, so it, now we've got this, uh, beca because we're working in restricted spec spectrum, we've got this wide tuning system that's going to give you the maximum um, options in terms of getting clear channels uh, to, to, to run, certainly for bigger productions. Uh, we've got um, the new high order digital modulation scheme. Audio quality is phenomenal. I mean, we've got 24 bit 48K. Um, converters in all of the transmitters. And that's really important because yeah. like big kind of thirsty shotguns would always kind of batter companders back in the old yes, days, right? Absolutely. Uh, there is no compounding in mm -hmm. the digital system. So back in, in analog days, you had to compress the audio, boost high frequencies f for noise reduction, transmit it, uncompress the audio and then reduce the high frequency. So it was quite, um, you know, it was quite punishing on the audio and also audio uh, you know, audio bandwidth was quite limited in the old system, so we've got 20 hertz to 20k in the digital system with no uh, compounding artifacts. Amazing. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for that run through, Dave. Really good overview of Axiom Digital and where we're at. Um, we're going to pop over to um, Stuart Stevens now, who's going to take us through the AD3 transmitter in a bit more detail. So that's what we're here to talk about today, really. Um, could you just talk us through the development of the AD3 and, and where it came from? Sure. So as Dave mentioned, when we were developing Axiom Digital, it was a, a very critical platform for us because we were replacing UHFR, which was a hugely successful platform for us, um, as well as Axiom, which although it was reserved for those high profile events, it, it gained a reputation as being a, a solid, reliable system that in situations where the mic just had to work, there was one system you went to and that was Axiom. Um, but there was markets like Shaw as a brand, we've always been very strong in touring um, and we wanted to try and build our reputation in the world of broadcast and theatre. So we've already made, um, we've had a lot of success with the launch of the ADX1M. That's proven to be quite popular in the theatre environments. Um, and even some things like when we launched the AD4s, um, because we had it in the back of our mind that we wanted to make this push into broadcast and broadcast TV and film, um, we launched two versions of the receiver. So you can get a standard AC version with a loop through and we also launched a DC powered version, either for redundancy, because redundancy was a big part of their system with the, the remote control aspects, um, but DC power gave us the flexibility where if your main AC source goes down, you either have a DC backup, um, but we've also seen some um, production sound mixers start to take the AD4 format on a DC power supply and use that in sound carts on uh, movie and TV sets. So. That was, uh, that's always been in the back of our mind when we developed this as a platform that we always wanted to expand upon it. Um, and as, as was mentioned previously, we had a plug-on transmitter with the UHFR system in the form of the UR3. So when we launched Action Digital in 2017, the 83A plug-on was always part of those discussions. So this wasn't a surprise to anybody internally. Um, obviously, w with any project that we develop with Ensure, we want to make sure that we're gathering the right market feedback. So 
once we'd actually got the basic mechanical design out the way, um, there's not a lot of room for too much creativity when you're developing a plug-on, so the mechanical design came easily. Um, we already had the RF modulation, or a lot of the complex development phases that take place when you're building a system like Axiom Digital, like your main feature sets, your modulation schemes, all of that work was done. So what we wanted to do with the AD3 was get it in the hands of people that use plugons on a daily basis, understand what are their kind of main grievances, what's, what's the little details that you can tweak and uh, adjust to make uh, yeah, a product that they will hopefully love to use and adopt more widespread. So. Um, I don't know if we want to. Well, so I guess what you're saying is yeah. it was always going to have to look like a plug-on, but we went out to the market, we found out what they liked, what they didn't like, what it had to, what it had to achieve. Yeah, exactly. And any project that we do, we typically go out to the market in a very early on in the process, show them some initial concepts. In some cases, that might be something as simple as here's some uh, image renderings of what we're coming up with user interface concepts. Um, with products like this, because that work was largely already done, it's more mechanical design, how does it feel in your hand, weighting with balance and things like that. Um, and then we take it back to the engineers, we provide them with that feedback, we make some revisions, uh, then we take the next iteration out to the same people, expand that group. Generally the closer we get to the launch, the more open we are to show it to more people and gather as much feedback as we can. Uh, and then yeah, we keep tweaking it until we've reached a point where yeah, we end up with a product like this, the finished product. Okay, well let's have a look at the actual features then of the AD3 uh, in detail. So we should have some, there we go. Um, just talk us through these, Stuart. So yeah, like I said, with a plug-on, um, especially with the AD3, we wanted to get out there and talk to the people that are using them on a regular basis and find out the, the little details. And it's things like that that led to um, the, the locking XLR connector. It, it seems like a really minor detail. It's the sort of thing that you'd e easily overlook because everybody wants to dive straight into the menus and see what cool features are in there. Um, but one thing we found is something as simple as if I'm using something like a VP89L, which is quite a long shotgun mic, I want to be sure that it is securely attached to that plug-on. And this uh, locking connector just allows you to secure the mic on and then you give it kind of a, a twist and it will secure it and lock it down in place. Um, and that's important because over the years, uh, if there's too much play in that connection, it can start to wear out your shotgun mics, um, like the, the actual physical XLR connector. So yeah, we want that was, again, a minor detail that seems quite insignificant, but plays a big part if you're using this on a regular basis. Uh, some of the common features to the Axiom Digital Platform, so AES-256 encryption, um, as Dave mentioned earlier. Movie sets now, some of those long-running TV dramas. Um, with an analog FM system, it's quite easy for any of these tabloidy style magazines to tune in to your transmitters, and they want to try and eavesdrop and get a sneak preview of what is the big cliffhanger story. Um, especially this time of year, as we approach Christmas and they typically do the same sort of like, oh, murder mystery mm -hmm. storyline. If you can get the uh, the exclusive story on that sort of thing, it, it was a big deal. It, it sold magazines. With encryption now, it prevents eavesdropping. You can really lock down and secure your set. So that's common to all the AD and ADX transmitters. And that's something you could never really do with analog transmission. No, as I said, like anybody that can buy an analog receiver can demodulate frequency modulated signals. Mm -hmm. um, whereas with a digital signal, a lot of the other, ourselves and the manufacturers making digital products have their own proprietary forms of codecs and tr transmission. So in order to decrypt or demodulate something, you would need access to the physical hardware, which at that point you've got wider security issues on your set if you've got strangers <laughs> coming in playing with your gear. Yeah. Um, RF output power, uh, 2, 10 and 35 milliwatts in there. So two milliwatts is common to all the transmitters as well. Just really, if your operating range isn't a huge concern, you can drop it down to two milliwatts. You minimize your contribution to the overall noise floor. Um, and it, it just makes the system a little bit more efficient for you. you. There's a tiny bit of battery life gain out of there. Um, but again, it's just a, a flexibility option there. Uh, I'm going to jump over these next two and jump just because I'll finish talking about the things that are common to all of them. Okay. The, uh, the built-in tone generator. So 
Again, this was introduced when we first shipped the AD series of transmitters um, three years ago now. And that was really just, we wanted the ability where if you don't have your presenter or your talent available and you just want to do a line check, all AD transmitters have a built-in tone generator that allows you, you to say, okay, just give me 400 hertz and you can button up to a certain level of dB and just double check your metering and double check your, your channels on the receive end without bothering any talent or anything like that. You can do a lot of that pre-prep work. And then these next features are common to, uh, well, not common, they are unique to the AD3. So there's a high pass filter in there that starts at 40 hertz and will allow the user to go up in 20 hertz steps up to 240. Uh, and that's really just if you're on an outdoor set, if you're in an environment where there's maybe some low end noise, you've got trucks rumbling past, just a lot of environmental noise that you want to cut out the signal, you can do that at the source before it's transmitted. So we have that high pass filter in there. 12 and 48 volt phantom power. So uh, 48 volts for things like Shaw shotgun mics. Um, there's historically some 12 volt shotgun mics on the market. So we wanted to ensure that we were suitable and could adapt to whatever anybody was using. Yeah. Obviously we prefer that everybody's using Shaw shotgun <laughs> mics, but we know that's not realistically the case. So really? we, we give people that flexibility. Uh, and then in terms of battery, again, like the, the minor details. So AD series um, are compatible with double A's and our Shaw SB900 lithium ions. Uh, the actual battery enclosure opens up in this kind of gull wing type design. You can see there that what um, image has the SB900 in place. And then it's uh, small things like the housing for the AA adapter. Mm. Um, just above the, the SB900, there's a small AA adapter there that just clips into that gull wing type bay door uh, and just holds your double A's securely in place so that you can trust that if it gets knocked, if it rolls off the desk onto the floor or something like that, you're not going to lose that power to the mic and subsequently lose the mic itself. Uh, and then lastly, USB-C power. So if you're using SB900 batteries, the USB-C provides um, the ability for you to charge the batteries while it is in the transmitter. Mm. So you can either in between shoots or in, yeah, in between shoots, if you have uh, some power available, just a standard sort of thing you'd get with your phone, you could just plug a USB-C cable in there and just keep your transmitters topped up while you break for lunch or coffees or things like that. Or some of those shows you see these days where it's like, uh, you, you wanted to hide a microphone under a table um, in the UK. It, it, I don't know if this would translate, but shows like Gogglebox, where you just want right. a, a kind of spot mic in a room capturing the overall audio of people speaking on sofas. You could hide an AD3 under the desk, some good old fashioned gaffer tape, um, things like a USB power bank, plug it into the AD3, and that could keep it running for an entire day. Um, if you have mains power there, you could just keep it plugged in and have a permanent plug on mic solution anywhere. So for things like a, a podium, if you've got a podium that you just wheel out uh, for a step for a presentation, mm -hmm. two AD3s in there for a redundancy of goosenecks, you could just have those plugged into a USB socket built into that podium, plug it into mains, and then your transmitters are going to be powered all day. You don't have to worry about your battery life at all. You don't have to run 100 meters of XLR all the way to the back of the rack. Exactly. That's the other benefit is that now your wireless podium is just permanently powered and will run all day long with no XLR cables involved. Amazing. Let's have a little look at the um, frequency variants available for the AD3 then. So, as Dave mentioned, the, the transmitters themselves are always paired to uh, or matched to an equivalent receiver version. Mm -hmm. So, in Europe, the most common version that we see is the A-band receivers paired with G56 transmitters. Um, in the US, this would be G57. And then those transmitters will vary based on things like regional compliance and what spectrum is available. But for the European market, those G56 transmitters will cover 470 up to 636 megahertz. If you wanted to extend into the upper end of the 600s, we do a B-band version with K55, which will take us as high as uh, 694 megahertz. And then for the UK only market, 
we have uh, we recently launched a X56 band, which operates in the DME spectrum. So that's 960 up to one gig or 1,000 megahertz. Um, but yeah, it's important to reiterate that that is a UK only specific band at this time. So and you need a specific receiver to, to operate that as well. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's X56 receivers with X56 transmitters. But the 83 is available in that as are the other AD and ADX transmitters. Um, and it's just, yeah, in an environment of shrinking spectrum, it gives us another alternative solution. And while we're on this slide, can we just talk about um, what you can expect to get in the box? So in the box, you will obviously receive your AD3. Uh, there is a, a kind of belt clip. So in um, news gathering applications, we sometimes see with plug-ons where they won't connect the mic directly to the transmitter. You actually have it clipped to a belt, and then they will use a standard kind of wired interview mic that they will hold. And it's not as common in Europe, but in the US, you would see like a mic flag that would have the, the logo of the broadcaster on there. Um, so we include that belt clip housing for the AD3 as well. You will get a set of AA batteries, uh, a USB-C cable for that charging benefit that I mentioned, as well as the power, uh, and then just a, a standard Shaw carrying pouch to hold that all together. Fantastic. Okay, well, thank you for that overview, Stuart. Um, let's come to some uh, real-world application stuff now. Before we do, um, I just want to say if there's any questions that you have, do please feel free to use the Q&A function that's uh, within the BlueJean software that you're viewing this on. Uh, but if we can have the, the close-up of the rack on screen now. And I'd actually like to come to Dave first. So we spoke about the ins and outs of Axiom Digital earlier. Um, can you just talk us through this hardware that we have uh, in front of us now? Yeah, so we've got the, the receiver and we've got the rear panel of the receiver on the bottom there. And we talked earlier on about uh, redundancy and scalability. So all the way from if we were using ADX transmitters, we can be broadcasting on two frequencies at the same time and replace either of those frequencies. Um, with AD transmitters, we can still use two body packs and do frequency diversity. Um, and the system will sum the audio either in the network or in the, you know, the regular audio outputs. Uh, so there's no hands-on management of that, and it will choose whichever of the the transmitters has the the best uh, is sending the best data essentially. Uh, so there's a level of redundancy there. Uh, the next step from that is we've got four network ports. So we've got um, we've got two for the Dante network. So in split redundant mode, uh, we've got redundancy on the Dante network, and we've also got redundancy for the control network. Um, at the same time as sending audio over the Dante network, we could also be sending it out over the AES3 digital output, and at the same time sending it out on the one of the analog outputs. Um, so we've got redundancy in the audio and redundancy in the network. And as Stuart said earlier on, uh, there is the option to specify the receiver at the point of purchase with a DC input module, or you can have that retrofitted afterwards by uh, at a subsequent date by our service guys. Uh, and that would then give you the uh, the, level, the redundancy in in the mains. Um, so at and that I'm point, if it's got two power sources, it will just choose whichever one is available and switch. That feature will also allow you to run the whole unit from a battery as well. Exactly that, yeah. So um, as Stuart said, yeah, a lot of broadcast companies build carts and build receivers into carts, and the whole thing is powered from a from a battery source. And each of those individual outputs you were describing is its its own thing, isn't it? So you can have an analog XLR, an analog TRS, and then digital over AES and digital over Dante with redundancy on the Dante, yes. all at the same time. Yes, yeah, we can do that. Fantastic. OK, let's uh, come back to Stuart Stevens then. Uh, let's set up an AD3. I know you've got one in front of <laughs> us. So if you could talk us through, you've just got it out of the box. You want to get it working with a shotgun mic. How, how is that process going to work? Yeah, so this unit has been factory reset. So this is exactly how it would be once you've pulled it out of the box. The only difference is it's currently running the SB900 batteries, which, of course, you will all purchase. Um, so. If I just stand up a second to make this a bit easier. So the first thing I'm going to do is just power the unit on. There we go. Can we see that on camera? Yeah, there we go. It's looking good. So yeah, it's factory reset. So it's got the standard Shaw name. It's going to start calculating me a battery life. Uh, 8 hours and 27 minutes there. If I cycle through, it's going to default to the lowest frequency, 47400. Um, it's going to give me a device name, which is an AD3. Uh, and I'm on group one, channel one. So the first thing I'm, I want to do is sync this with my chosen receiver channel. So 
for the purposes of this demonstration. I'm going to use channel four. I've already done a spectrum scan. Um, I've coordinated my frequencies in channel 38 because that's what we have a license for here. And I want to make sure I'm using licensed clean frequencies. So on the actual AD3, we have a, an IR window and there's an IR window on the receiver here. I'm just going to press the, the sync button where it will search for the transmitter. Once I've lined it up, it will say sync success. And now if I just turn this for a second, I've synced it, but I'm not getting any audio. Uh, the most obvious thing is I can see here on the front of the receiver, there's a little icon that says phantom off. Now I know that this is a condenser shotgun microphone, so I'm going to need to enable Phantom on that. And I will start that again because it's just habit to pull it in front of me and not do it to camera. Um, so if I enter the menu and I go down to audio, first option is Phantom. I can go in there and I can enable 48 volts of Phantom power. If I exit back out, at that point then, we can see on the front of the receiver, I'm starting to get audio in and I have an icon there that's changed to say plus 48 volts. So the next step would be to, to set the gain for this transmitter thing because it looks like the gain on that's a little bit low. So how can you talk about how the gain works in X and Digital? Because it's a bit different, isn't it, to analog systems that people might have used in the past? Yeah, compared to an analog system where you would historically adjust the sensitivity before transmission because you wanted to maximize your signal to noise ratio ahead of the transmission, in a digital system, what we're doing is we're converting that incoming audio into a digital bit stream pretty much immediately as it hits the transmitter. So at that point, all of our transmitter gain adjustments are done at the receiver end. It's all like a digital, it's done in the digital realm. So from this channel now, I can, from this main menu, hit edit. I can select my channel gain, and as I adjust it up and down, you can see my audio metering is getting stronger as I'm getting more level, or I mean, boosting the digital gain of the entire system. So just to confirm, that's that's not like the transmitter sensitivity. That's everything all the way through to the outputs on the back, isn't it? Yeah, correct. And if I was to delve deeper into this actual channel menu. Um, you would be able to see under the audio settings, we actually have an option called system gain, where it will show me that my transmitter is an AD3, my receiver gain is set at plus 26. So if I was to take an output from the quarter inch settings, my overall gain in the system is plus 38. There's a, a whole discussion around why it's plus 38 mm -hmm. that we do an Action Digital Certification course on, and you can come and learn that. But for the purposes of this, yeah, it's all the gain adjustments take place in the world of digital, and then we go through the, the kind of digital to analog stage at the very end. Okay. So the next thing that people might have seen on devices before, and we've all you know we all know about, is the RS uh, SID indicators. So how much RF is coming into the system, and we're all used to seeing those left and right meters kind of bump up and down. But we have a new measure of this, don't we? We have a new meter to consider in Axiom Digital. Correct. So. Uh, as you've kind of mentioned, historically, these A and B icons, or LED meters, uh, are what's known as RSSI, the Received Stri Signal Strength Indicators. And they um, are a measure of how strong is my received RF signal on that channel. And in the world of analog, that was a very good indicator, because in analog FM, the amount of RF I'm receiving is directly relates to the audio signal to noise. So in an analog FM system, I would want those to be nice and strong because the stronger they were, the higher quality my audio was. If they started getting down near the noise floor, I knew my audio was going to suffer at the same time. In the world of digital, because we're just sending digital information, these are still useful but they're not as useful in the, uh, as they were in the world of analog because there isn't that direct relationship between audio signal to noise and RF signal to noise. As long as I'm receiving RF at a suitable standard or quality, my audio signal to noise is not going to be impacted in any way. And that's where this new meter, the channel quality indication comes in. Because these RSSI indicators start at about minus 90 dBm and they increase by 5 dBm increments uh, up until I think minus 70 is the, the peak one then before we hit RF overload. But what those don't tell me 
is how much of these five LED uh, or LEDs that are lit, how much of that is being contributed by my transmitter and how much of it is being contributed by noise or perhaps another transmitter that could cause interference. Um, for example, if I parked this on a DTV channel, I'd probably, especially around here from Crystal Palace, I'd probably get a nice strong signal. If I tuned onto a frequency nearby, I might look at this rack and think, hey, I'm getting five bars of RSSI, I can walk this thing 60 meters and it'll be great. But what I'm not seeing with this image is if this were to drop from five to three, once I hit three, that could be a source of interference. Mm. So whereas I think I'm gonna get 60 meters of range, I walk 10 meters from my rack and I'm getting dropouts and the systems just mutes and I'm, I don't understand why. Channel quality gives us that kind of bit of information we were missing. It gives us that viewpoint into what is my RF signal to noise ratio like? How strong is my carrier above the RF noise floor? And that could either be just the noise floor of the environment we're in, or it could be the noise floor of the an adjacent transmitter. So for example, you could turn up, you've done your scan, noise floor is nice and quiet, you coordinate your frequencies, you go for lunch. While you're on lunch, another person's turned up with their version of transmitters. Your transmitters aren't currently on, so they've done the same thing, tuned, scanned, found decent frequencies. And when you return from lunch, you notice that your RSSIs are still nice and strong. Your transmitters are a meter away from the rece receiving antennas. You're still getting a nice strong signal strength into the system, but now your channel quality bars dropped to one or two bars. And that just gives you a little bit more information to like, hey, something's going on with the system here. My signal's strong, but my quality is poor. And Why that, is that? In that scenario, will the system give you any kind of warnings to suggest that there might be a problem as well? If it is caused by another transmitter, as Dave mentioned, one of the things we carried over from the, the old, old legacy Axiom analog system was the ability to detect and alert users of potential sources of interference or interference events that have occurred in the past. So you will get an indication to say interference alert on this channel on the receiver. Um, if you're running the software as well, you will also have a, an interference alert message on there. So whenever you return back to your hardware, it will still it's persistent and you will have to clear it yourself. It so will that, stay there. So that does help out with the age old, oh, did I hear an RF hit there or was it just something that I imagined? Yeah, correct. Yeah, um, of course, simply just walking out of range of antennas. Obviously, these are directional antennas. If I walked 40 meters behind them where they're not designed to pick up in that direction, you would start to see the quality meter drop. And that's simply you're getting closer to the noise floor. Like I said, it's a measure of your RF signal to noise. Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you for that overview. I think we've covered quite a lot of ground there. The last thing that I'd like you to just talk us through is um, wireless workbench. And some people will be very familiar with wireless workbench, but I know some uh, particularly broadcast and kind of sound recordists that might use this type of kit possibly haven't used it before. So if we can go uh, and just delve into the software very quickly. Of course, this is going to be a very quick overview of wireless workbench. Um, I'll mention that we do host courses for wireless workbench. If you want to go into the software in more detail, learn more about the RF coordination kind of tips and tricks and tools that are available to you. But I'll just break down the three main viewing windows when you open up the software. So all of, I have a network connection here to the rack behind me. So all of my devices are online. I can flash all devices and you would see them all flash behind me as well. Um, but this is a main inventory window where you would do things like you would adjust your channel names if you wanted to name these after key presenters or casts, um, if you wanted to ID your racked equipment. This is like a, the, the main window for that. The frequency coordination window is where you can pull in scans from either um, things like the XT600 Spectrum Manager. Uh, all of our networked receivers can scan within their tuning window as well. So any scan is better than no scan. Mm -hmm. So if you have a networked receiver, just grab some data and pull it in there. And this is where you can do things like your coordinating around DTV channels, um, being more precise about where you want to position your transmitters for that production. But the main one I'll cover today is just this monitor view. So the monitor view here, I can see the information I have from my online devices. I have um, my 
Q and my AD4D. So if I just sort those by type, that will split them up. I know that my AD3 transmitter was channel four of the quad receiver because I've just paired it. So if I select this now, this uh, channel strip view, it brings up this monitor widget. And that just presents me with um, a replication or of what you would see on the receiver itself. So as I mentioned, you've got the, the RSSI indicators on there from 90 to minus 70. Uh, audio metering, you get an indication of what frequency you want, uh, are you on, but also what TV channel that relates to. As you can see, I'm in TV 38. The device itself, so that's taken from the device ID. Um, current RF output power, so 10 milliwatts is this transmitter. Uh, whether encryption is enabled or disabled. Uh, and then things like the, the battery life. Mm. Because I have that Shaw SB900, I can take that uh, battery telemetry and it can tell me that this transmitter just sat on the desk like that will give me six hours and 42 minutes. And that's accurate to uh, plus or minus 15 minutes. So I can be fairly comfortable that I'll get six hours and 15 minutes out of there before I'd have to go back to that transmitter. Yeah. Now, just to be clear, you, you can name these devices so they would show up with names in this window, right? You don't have to go through and yeah, say it's correct. channel 4. Yeah, correct. So three. if I um, went here and said, uh, oh, I don't know, let's call it after the model. So that's a VP82 shotgun there. Uh, so as I n rename that channel there, you'll notice that the, the name at the top changes as well to match that channel name. So you could pair these up with, as I said, presenter names, uh, names of the talent. If there's someone particularly important, you can assign colors to these as well. So if you know maybe someone needs a bit more extra care and attention, you can assign them red so that it immediately catches your eye. Um, and likewise, you can also adjust the size of these. So like I said, if there's someone that needs attention, you could make them the most important critical person. And then everybody else, these could just be transmitters that also are important, but perhaps not as needy as some of those other ones. So you can keep an eye on them without them drawing all your focus and attention. And even with the, the fact that we're in AD transmitters here and we are only sending information in one direction, we do have some control, don't we, over, over our transmitters from this page? Yeah, so in a digital system, because as I mentioned, the, the gain is being adjusted in the digital realm now, and I have a network connection to that receive channel, I can actually adjust that gain up and down. So if I speak into this microphone as well now, as I'm turning it down, you'll notice that my level goes down. Um, so it's definitely making that adjustment on the actual receiving channel. And as I start to increase the gain on this, uh, uh, again, you will see that adjustment live on the audio metering section. And that's not just AD3, that's the body packs as well, right? Yeah, that's any AD transmitter. It, the, because the gain adjustment's happening at the receiver end, any receiver or any transmitter you sync with that receiver will have that ability. And then you can also just um, mute that channel. So if you wanted to just uh, audio mute it and prevent any audio from going downstream, you can do that from um, wireless workbench as well. Okay, let's have a little look at the timeline next if we can. Yeah, of course. So this, um, well, there's actually three different aspects of timeline. The first one, because I'm already on this view, I'll talk about is what we call the mini timeline. So the mini timeline is available to any of the transmitters uh, or any of your channels within this monitor view. And what it does is it actually gives you a, a scrolling two minute window of information from that channel. So starting from the top, the first bit of information is my quality meter here in purple. Um, these two scrolling blue bars are my tone key. So all of our transmitters have a tone key so they won't actually open up and pass any audio until it's recognized that it's a valid Axiom digital transmitter. Um, these are also useful to monitor your actual antenna positions, because if you start to see gray kind of blips or gray bars on either A or B, you will notice that um, within the timeline that will be visible and you can say, okay, I'm getting a dropout. I lost tone key on antenna A. Why was that? And you can do some investigative work. Um, beneath that is my actual RSSI indicators. So these, I'm probably a meter, just over a meter away from the antenna. So you can see these are very stable. Both A and B incoming RSSI are pretty much pegged at minus 70 and there's not much fluctuation there. Uh, this small kind of exclamation mark, that's telling me about those interference events that we discussed earlier. 
Um, I have audio metering in here. So again, if I, um, I won't put this on camera because I'm do it very quickly. If I go in here and enable the tone generator that I discussed, you'll see that that meter just gets absolutely pegged as it goes up and down. And you'll notice that the, the RF meters have adjusted as well. And you can, that tone generator is, is adjustable in um, dB increments, isn't it? Yeah, correct. Um, so, and again, common to all AD and ADX transmitters. Um, this next one in the timeline is really just for the, once you enable that ADX um, transmitter remote control, that's through a protocol that we have called Showlink. So this allows you to monitor your Showlink reception. Um, and then we have, um, you can adjust how you want to view your battery, uh, remaining battery life in either percentage or just standard 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 bars. So that's the mini timeline. As I said, there's three of these. So let's say you've been running the mini timeline, you, you hear a, an odd noise, you think you've had a blip of RF interference, or somebody's walked off to an area of the set that you think you might have had a dropout and lost A and B antennas. You maybe see a dip on your mini timeline and you want to, you think, you know what, I want to capture this information, I want to be able to review it later. Here's where you can hit auto timeline and that will grab all the channels that are on your network, that are online devices, and it will just start grabbing the same information. From here, you can go in and you can control what information you would like to see there. Um, it also drops this marker here to say, okay, this was your previous two minutes leading up to this event. Here's where you started the timeline, and then here's the continuation of that show or production. And this is recording, isn't it, now? This is saving the information. So if you wanted to come back to it later and review it, you have the opportunity to do so. Exactly. So in information, it says that I'm live. Um, the amount of data it takes up is incredibly small. So you can see if I was to leave this running, assuming nothing happened to my laptop, which, I mean, is unlikely, I could leave this recording for 168 weeks before it would run out of data. Right. Uh, and that's based on me having 115 gigabytes of free space on this laptop. If I increase that drive, I could increase the amount of uh, recording time I have. Uh, I'm just going to stop this now. Uh, I won't save that information. Uh, and I will talk about the, the final timeline. So the final timeline is, uh, here's one I made earlier, very uh, Ainsley Harriet. So let's <laughs> delete this view. Um, if you've opened Workbench, you haven't started any mini timelines, you haven't hit the auto timeline, and you, the downside of the auto timeline is it will grab every single channel, because yeah. it's like an emergency, something's happened, I need to grab everything and I'll filter it later. With this timeline, you can be more precise about what channels you want to look at. So for example, I could say, I'm only interested in looking at my AD3, and I know that I am currently on uh, channel, your channel Which one of the AD4. Channel. Again, you would probably no, have named I've, your... I've renamed uh, the wrong one, yeah. <laughs> you would probably I've, have... Oh, no, there I am. Yeah, you're It's there. the device ID. There we go. So you would probably name so, your yeah. channels before you went and did this. Exactly. So I would name it after myself so that I don't have multiple channel yeah. ones busy trying to work out which one I am. Um, so I only want to look at my own body pack transmitter I've got on, this plug on, and then I can start the timeline. And... Another thing is, I don't know if we want to cut back to the, the camera shot there, is all the AD transmitters. If I go into the actual menu, if I scroll down to utilities here, there's an option there that says marker. And it will say press enter to mark. And then it will, if you press enter, it will say marker sent. And what that's doing is that's sending a message to the receiver that is then being passed over the network back to Wireless Workbench that is then dropping markers. So if I just continue to drop a few and then we'll go back to uh, Wireless Workbench in a second. So let's just drop So this could more. be you've you know, set your RF up, you're quite happy, and you just want to check where the RF black spots are going to be in the space, right? You could take your device out and then just drop some of these. Yeah, exactly. You just want to verify your antenna positions. Is there anything on site that's mm -hmm. going to cause you any issues, Any like anything around a corner that might cause you some shadows that you're going to get some drop-offs in RF? You can take one of your transmitters. Uh, you can walk around the set by yourself. You can drop those markers as you're in key locations. And then if I stop the timeline, I'll call this, yeah, let's call it, I don't know, what did I call it earlier? Oxford Circus. So I'm doing some filming around there. Mm -hmm. 
And then when I come back, uh, I will minimize my own transmitter because that's not the important one. I can actually go through and I can look then and evaluate the RF performance at each marker. And then in the actual marker list, I can go through and say, OK, this was maybe well. tube entrance. Mm -hmm. If I was doing a shot where somebody was coming out of the tube at Oxford Circus and walking down the street, I can drop these markers and then I can actually go back and evaluate what was the, the RF environment like in each of those points. Amazing. Okay, well, thank you so much for that overview, Stuart. Um, we're going to come to some questions now. We have had um, a question come in. Please, anybody that is watching this, if you have got questions, feel free to ask some more. I've also got some questions that were um, asked by people that could not attend today. But we'll start off with the question that we've had live. So this is from uh, Mark Buckley, and I think this is a question for Stuart Stevens. Um, Mark asks, how does the phantom power affect the battery life? So it's almost like we anticipated this question and I checked it earlier. So as you, just going back, when I turned this on with no phantom power, I had about eight hours and 20 minutes. Uh, at 12 volts phantom power, when I tested it earlier, that cost me about 45 minutes. Um, 48 volts cost me about just over an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes. Um, so yeah, there, there is an impact from having that 48 volt phantom power on there. Uh, and that's where sometimes one of the benefits of that USB-C power mm -hmm. to just tape up a, an, an additional power supply there if you do have a, a shoot that's going to last longer than six and a half hours. Um, uh, you'd have to trust me, but yeah, six and a half hours left remaining on that transmitter. Okay. Thank you for that answer. Um, the next question that we've had, again, is, is for Stuart Stevens. Popular um, guy. And uh, <laughs> this relate to um, receiver platforms okay. and specifically the fact that we have a portable transmitter now to turn any wired microphone wireless uh, but our receiver platform um, still requires mains power now as we've discussed earlier you can get a dc input for these to run it on the battery but it's still you know a kind of rack piece of equipment and um, could you speak to anything that might be in in planned in preparation for a more portable receiver platform uh, Again, going back to what I said earlier, when we launched Axion Digital, we always knew it was going to be a platform that we would build and, and continue to develop on. Um, again, at the risk of repeating myself, we've been very strong in touring. Um, broadcast and theatre was a target for us. You can see the work we've done with theatre with uh, the ADX1M. That's born out of a lot of conversations with sound designers in those markets. Uh, we've been having those same conversations and you can see those Things like the, the, the fact that we offer the DC option came out of a desire to get more involved in TV, uh, film and broadcast. Um, the recent collaborations that we've done with platforms like Q5X who were involved in sports broadcasting, um, doing action digital versions of their kind of player mic and aqua mic transmitters. So the question of portable receivers is an obvious one. It comes up quite a lot. And uh, yeah, we're, we're always developing new and interesting stuff for the Axiom Digital. So, so watch, watch this, this space, space is the uh, catchphrase. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, Dave, I've got one for you. OK. Um, we mentioned HD mode earlier. Would you be able to just go into a very small amount of detail about what HD mode is and, and why you might want to use it within Axiom Digital? Yeah, so basically um, what we're doing when we go into HD mode is we reduce the power of the transmitter a little bit. Mm -hmm. That has the effect of reducing the RF footprint of, uh, of the, the carrier. Um, it also, I mean, typically there are, we, we can't go into the physics of intermods, but typically there are almost no intermods with digital systems, and that applies to all digi digital systems, not, not just Shures, but the intermods are then, if there are any present or solo, they're buried in the noise floor, so we can ignore them from a coordination point of view, and we can then go at a much closer uh, a step rate for p packing channels very close together. Uh, the caveat is that you would probably not use that mode in very high RF noise environments because we have reduced the power of the transmitter a little bit. And again, if people want to know more about the physics of, of the digital modulation scheme and how reducing the power moves the symbols in a constellation, in a quam constellation closer together, come and do one of the wireless master, uh, master class courses and we talk a great length about that. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, but it has the effect of being able to move the, the pack the channels 
very close together and do what's called equal, equal distance spacing so we can pack them instead of having to do a, an offset coordination to account for intermods which is particularly important in analog world uh, we can do an equal distance grid and we can pack up to 63 channels uh, in, uh, in an 8 meg tv channel it's really useful for controlled environments you know so in corporate world um, they quite often use the hd mode because nobody's going to turn up uh, with a, an analog IEM system, unlocked to 100 you know, milliwatts and turn it on using yesterday's coordination and suddenly cause problems for the active transmitters that are on the stage. Um, but yes, so come, come to the Wireless Masterclass and learn more about that. So for corporate environments, breakout rooms, things like that, it's yeah, great. For something yeah. like this, you probably want the rock solid RF. You probably would, yeah. Okay. Unless, unless there was an, in, I mean, unless you were using uh, you know, a, an incredibly large number of channels in a small amount of spectrum, that, then uh, then that would be an option. But it w the caveat would be that the RF conditions would have to be good enough to support that. Okay, thank you for that, Dave. One last question for you, Stuart. Um, we've had something come in regarding shore channels. So, could you just talk a little bit about what shore channels is, and can you use it with this system, and why would it be of advantage? Yeah. So, to support um, wireless workbench, a couple of years ago we launched. Um, an iOS application called Shore Channels. Um, Shore Channels basically took the information that you would get from a monitor view um, and added some control aspects to it as well. So the things, like I said there, you can, if you add a wireless access point to your rack of gear, you can set up channels, you can actually make those digital gain adjustments, you can monitor your RSSI and audio meters from uh, an iOS device now, like an iPad or an iPhone. Um, Recently, there was an update to, um, to make all of the control aspects of that free of charge. Mm -hmm. So if you have Accent Digital with, um, or ULXD, it used to be the case that there'd be in-app purchases for those. That's now completely open. So I would encourage everybody to download channels. There's a demo mode in there so you can get an idea for mm -hmm. the sort of information you can see. It's all unlocked. It's all available no matter what network, shore system you have. There's n nothing else to pay. Um, and you get all the monitoring and control aspects from Wireless Workbench in a, a portable form. And Wireless Workbench, is there's no cost to that either, is there? No, Wireless Workbench is a tool that we've always given away, um, complimentary with to any of our customers. Um, and part of that is because it, it is such a powerful bit of software that we, we want everybody to be using it. It's, great for coordination. It allows you to do very creative things with inclusion and exclusion groups to get yourself uh, a kind of rock solid coordination. Uh, and then you get the, the added benefits where if you are using Shure network systems, you have the control and the monitoring functionality there as well. But yeah, w Workbench has always been something that we've kind of gifted to the industry. Okay. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen. Dave from our sales team and Stuart from product development uh, for joining us here today and running us through that. Uh, we hope that was informative for you. If you have any further questions, do please feel free to get in touch with any of us. Um, we will be doing another one of these webinars. I think we're talking about doing an Accent Digital for broadcast-specific webinar quite soon where we will run through all of the transmitters, all the show link, all the Q5 stuff, absolutely everything with the broadcast focus as well. Um, as Dave mentioned, we offer... Uh, courses on um, RF generally and also on wireless workbench. So if you want to attend one of those, stay up to date with the mailing list, keep looking at what's going on, and we will have some of those coming up for you very soon as well. But for the time being, I think it's time for us to say goodbye. So from Dave Stewart and myself, um, it's been a pleasure. Thanks very much. Bye, everybody.